My name is Ephraim Katsir, and on behalf of Sephardic Heritage International in DC or Shin DC, I welcome all of you to a Farhood commemoration through history, music, and food. Shin DC builds intercultural bridges while raising awareness of Sephardic and other underrepresented Jewish heritages and the cultures, arts, and history of the Middle East, North Africa, the Iberian Peninsula, Greece, and Central and Western Asia. I'd just like to acknowledge some colleagues I know are with us for tonight's program. Welcome to Rabbi Dr. Elia Badi, Isaac Shua from Asafaradi, and Asher Shasho Levy. Also, thank Shin DC board members that are with us here tonight. Yesterday was Memorial Day. And we remembered those who made the ultimate sacrifice serving the United States. Later this week, we have the Jewish holiday of Shavuot. Today, we remember those whose lives were lost on Shavuot in 1941 in Baghdad, when an outbreak of mob violence against Baghdadi Jewry, known as the Farhud, erupted. The UN recognizes June 1st as International Farhud Day. It was a turning point in the lives of Iraqi Jews. Today, we honor the memories of those whose lives were lost by learning about the Farhud, as well as the cuisine and musical tradition of, of Baghdadi Jewry. So to begin with the history, we have Maurice Shohet. Maurice Shohet is managing editor of the Washington Institute for Near East Policies Arabic language website, president of World Organization of Jews from Iraq, and is Sephardic Heritage International in DC board member. Maurice is also an Iraqi Jew, born and raised in Baghdad. His personal family history is represented in the Iraqi Jewish archives. So we now have Maurice Shohet to speak about commemorating the Farhud and 2,600 years of Babylonian Jewry. Uh Thank you. I would like to thank Frank Katsir for his initiative for this event today. As he mentioned, it was June 1st, 1941, when the Farhud occurred. It was on the first day of Shavuot. Now, there is no known definite meaning for the word for Farhud. Uh, according to the scholar Edwin Black, who wrote uh, a lot about this subject, he defined it as uh, violent dispossession. Uh, the word is not in Arabic. What I read once that the first time it was used, it was during World War I, when Iraq was under the Ottoman Empire, and when the Turkish soldiers didn't get that, their payments before the holidays, they used to loot stores in the markets in Baghdad to make living. And that's how the beginning of the word Farhud started and uh, eventually it was uh, used when the Jews suffered from it in 1941. Uh, if there are any people from Iraq who are watching right now, I would like to say a couple of words in Arabic to welcome them. أهلا وسهلا بالعراقيين اللي دا يتابعون هذه المناسبة أود أن أعرب عن تهانينا لكم بمناسبة عيد الفطر الذي كان هذا الأسبوع Now I will continue to my uh, presentation If I may, I will share screen with you and let me know if uh, you can see it 
Can you? Yes. Okay. Uh, as Frame defined the event, uh, for who reflecting the 2600 use of Babylonian Jewry. <clears throat> How this all thing started was between the years 33 and 39, when Nazi leader Adolf Hitler was appointed Chancellor of Germany on January 1933. At the time, an anti-Semitic German envoy, Dr. Fritz Groba, was sent to Baghdad. It happened that the same year, King Faisal I died in Iraq, and his son, King Ghazi, became uh, the new king uh, in April 1933. Uh, it's interesting, after his appointment as king, the first Nazi youth organizations began to be formed in Iraq. Of course, we cannot say that he was behind it, but uh, it was the influence of the German envoy, Dr. Fritz Grober. This intensified in 1936, when Mufti of Jerusalem, Haj Amin al-Husseini, arrived to Iraq and began to incite against the Jews. During that period, the first Jews ever were killed in Iraq during the period 1936-1939, following the Arab revolt in Palestine. And no known Jews were ever killed during that period. The interesting part that happened in the, after the German envoy came to Baghdad in the spring of 1934, Fritz Groba, the ambassador, reported that an Iraqi newspaper which called Al Alam Al Arabi, which means the Arab world, has begun to print extracts from Hitler's Ming camp in Arabic. Uh, the writer of that first translation of uh, certain paragraphs was Yunus Sabawi, that uh, I will mention more his name later. Fritz Groba, in his letter to the Foreign Office in Berlin, he advocated turning the translated extracts into a and giving the project German financial backing. That was the first beginning of the translation of Mein Kampf into Arabic. There were many versions that were translated. The reasons are that apparently the original version, Mein Kampf, has something anti-Arabic as well not only anti-Jewish, but the Germans worked it out where they gave a new version of Mein Kampf where they eliminated anything that refers to Arabs and they gave new versions for the Arabic version to be translated. So these are just examples of the first uh, known uh, translations. As I mentioned, the Mufti of Jerusalem, Haj Amin al was uh, the driving force behind instigating the local uh, Arab youth organizations against the Jews. And we can see here when he met Hitler in Germany. Here his picture again, he salutes the, sorry about that. He salutes 
the German SS army in Berlin. And you can see the honor that was given to him by Hitler to be able to salute the SS army. Now, there was a <coughs> Iraqi politician who was cooperating with the Germans in Baghdad, and his name was Rashid Ali Gailani. He was Minister of Interior and later on Prime Minister. And again, uh, the same thing as we saw in the previous page, he went and met Hitler. In 1941, for a period of less than a month, uh, there was some kind of a war in Iraq called the Anglo-Iraqi War. Haj Amin al-Husseini, the Mufti of Jerusalem, arrived to Iraq for the second time on October 14, 1939. Because they worked for many years to have followers, in the Iraqi army, they were able to assemble them. And in January 1941, the pro-Nazi Prime Minister Rashid Ali Gailani that we saw in the previous page was forced to step down. But with the active backing of Haj Amin al-Husseini, al Gailani and a group of military officers staged a coup in April 1941, where they took over the rule in Baghdad, in Iraq, and a British-led Allied military campaign started for the period between May 2nd to 31st, 1941. On May 31st, that revolt of Rashid Ali Gailani fell, and he and the Mufti of Jerusalem fled Iraq, and the next day was the Shavuot, and how that was the next day the Farhud occurred. As I mentioned earlier, the Farhud refers to the attack against the Jews, the Jewish community in Baghdad, on the Feast of Weeks, Chag HaShavuot, for the first two days. It occurred immediately following the British victory in the Anglo-Iraqi war. And <clears throat> Rashid Ali, who had seized power during the, the Second World War, uh, fled the country. The next day, the Farhud started. These are the pictures that are available from that period when the masses went on in the streets and their supporters on the balconies of the houses and buildings in Iraq. This is another picture, uh, similar to the previous ones. Uh, and I have to mention when this took place because the government of Rashid Ali fell after the war with the British there was no government in Baghdad. So there was a chaos. So the masses took, took advantage of this chaos and we see him, we see them in this picture. I have a story about this specific picture. In 2006, I was at an event uh, <coughs> at the American Military University in Washington, D.C. And over there, I met someone by the name Asad Barak. So immediately, another name, Barak, came to my mind, Salman al-Barak. So I asked him, are you related to him? He said, yes, my grandfather. 
So I started to be sure what his background is and what did his, his uh, grandfather do in Iraq. And it's exactly what's written here in this picture that his grandfather was tribal chief in Hella, minister of irrigation between 1928 and 1929, later president of the chamber of deputies. So I told him I have a story that I heard from my mother. My mother in 1941 was single. And when the Farhud about to be to begin because they marked the Jews, the houses of, cert, of certain Jews in certain areas, my, great, um, parent, my grandparents' house was marked. So my grandmother, my mother's mother, asked one of the neighbors if he agrees to take them. The first one refused, probably he was afraid. The second one agreed. That was Salman al-Barak, whose picture is here. He, is, he gave the house to my grandmother's family, including my mother with him, with 10 children. And not only that, but he brought his guards from his business in irrigation and agriculture to protect the house. So when the masses came to attack, someone mentioned to them that this Jewish family moved to this house and they pointed out to Salman al-Barak house. But when they came to try to attack, my mother's family in that house, the guards shoot some shots in the air in order to scare the masses and they fled. I heard the story from my mother and the name Salman Barak will stay with our family forever. Following the collapse of the pro-Nazi regime in Iraq in 1941, we can see from this picture, Haj Amin al-Husseini and Rashid Ali al-Gailani, both, this is Rashid Ali and this is Haj Amin al-Husseini. They celebrated the anniversary of the coup in Germany in 1942. There were many killed in Iraq among the Jews and their pieces were all over the place. So there was no DNA at the time, of course, and no one was able to locate who, whose hand or whose part of this body belongs to what Jew. So the Jewish community had a mass grave and this picture is from 1946, that since has been destroyed, of all those that no one knew who they are, and they couldn't identify them. So there was mass graves. Unfortunately, it's no more there. Interesting part is this picture of one of the Ba'ath Party leaders, his name, was Khairallah Talfah, who was Saddam Hussein's uncle and maternal, maternal uncle and father-in-law of Saddam Hussein. He participated in the Anglo-Iraq war against the British and he was pro-Nazi. That was the picture from that time. Khairal al was imprisoned for five years for his support of the revolt against the British during World War II and was subsequently expelled from the army in 1941 after the failure of the revolt. In the 40s of the 20th century, 
Mr. Talfah uh, wrote a 10 page booklet. He called it Three Whom God Should Not Have Created Persians, Jews, and the Flies. I wrote here in Arabic the name of the book, that pamphlet that he wrote at the time. Three whom God should not have created, Persians, Jews, and the flies. He wrote it in 1940, but Iraq never published it. And it was published only when the Ba'ath Party came to power and his nephew became vice president first and then president. Obviously, from the name, the document is highly derogatory towards Persians and Jews. This is Khairalat al Fah in the middle with Saddam Hussein on the right, picture from 1972, and one of Saddam Hussein's sons on the left. Obviously, all of them were killed. Uh, you know, Khairalat al Fah died in 1989, but Saddam Hussein and uh, his son were killed by following the 2003 war of Iraq. How many Jews in Iraq were affected? Again, there were different versions, different sources. The minimum figure of those who were killed is 179. The maximum is 400. Number of wounded between 850 and 2118. Number of children or orphaned. The exact number was known, 242. Shops looted between 600 to 2,371. And 6,558 houses damaged. Because at the time they used to have the figures according to the British system, the British estimated the losses to the property between 680,000 pounds to 3 million and a half pounds at the time, of course. The Commission of Inquiry, following the failure of the revolt of the 1941, a commission was set up by the new Iraqi government. According to scholars, its investigation found that the Mufti and the Nazi propaganda broadcasts he made on Nazi-sponsored radio were the primary reasons behind the slaughter. That's the investigation conclusion. The Mufti's incitement against the Baghdadi Jews, said the commission, served to legitimize violence against them. In effect, the Mufti and his followers were directly responsible for the pogrom. The results of the investigation were not made public at the time and stayed like this for 17 years. But in 1958 and following the revolution in Iraq when it became republic, a study by the Iraqi historian Abdul Razak al Hassani about the factors that contributed to the Farhud was published in Beirut, not in Iraq. Uh, and this is exactly what Abd Razak al Hassani wrote from that investigation. I am quoting here Acts of incitement by the anti Semitic German envoy in Baghdad, doctors, Dr. Fritz Groba. The activities of Hajj Amin al Husseini, the Mufti of Jerusalem, and his retinue, who succeeded in influencing religious, educational, and military leaders. Incitement by Syrian and Palestinian teachers. Propaganda broadcast in Arabic from Berlin. And the of the propaganda at the time in Berlin was an Iraqi by the name Yunus Sabawi. 
false reports spread by the Iraqi radio about anti-Arab activities by Jews in Palestine, which was part of propaganda campaign against the Jews, as well as several youth brigades, such as al Fatuwa, which means in, in Arabic youthfulness, and Kataib al-Shabaab, which means youth battalions in Iraq, which were taught Nazi philosophy by their instructors. Those are the reasons for the for Hood that, as I mentioned, minimum 179 people were killed. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maurice, for sharing that with us. Next, we have Vered Gutman. <laughs> 